It always starts simple. One ability, one behavior, a clean method, maybe a hard-coded number or two. Then the requirements change. We need to slow the target now, or actually scale damage based on level, and apply knockback, but only if they're not stunned. You patch it in, one more condition, one more parameter, one more edge case, and before you know it, you've coded yourself into a corner. This week, I saw the result of that approach firsthand. 40,000 lines of logic-driven code. And the catch? The original developer left the project. Now every change is a risk, nobody wants to touch it. But what if that behavior didn't live inside your code? Let me show you what that looks like. We all know the logic-driven approach. Everything hard-coded, brittle, and tightly coupled. Now let's flip the model completely. Instead of writing code for every ability variation, we're going to define behavior as data and let the system execute it. Here's the foundation, a scriptable object that describes an ability entirely through configuration. Let's add an attribute so we can create these inside of Unity's project view. Each of our abilities is going to apply effects. Let's have an abstract base class for all of the effects. We'll mark this and any subclasses as serializable so Unity can serialize them when stored as part of a serialized reference list. Each effect will implement an execute method. We'll get the caster and the target and apply our logic accordingly. Back up in our ability data, let's first of all have a label to represent this ability. And then let's have a serialized reference list of all the effects that belong to this ability. For convenience, let's add an onEnable method. Let's say if the label hasn't been set yet, let's just give it the file name. And we could also say if the list hasn't been initialized yet, let's just set it to be an empty list. Now let's create a few of these ability effects for our demo. We could have one effect that just applies flat damage to the target. This effect would just have an amount of damage. In the execute method that we're going to override, we just grab the main health component from the target and apply the damage. We can log something out to the console so that we can see this as we're testing. But let's also add one more just for some variation. Let's have a knockback effect. So the knockback effect will need to know a force to apply. And then in the execute method, let's calculate a direction for the knockback. We can grab the target's rigid body and apply that force to it using force mode impulse. Again, let's log something out so that we can know what's happening before we even apply any visuals. So far, this is looking pretty straightforward, but we will need some kind of component on the player to actually execute these abilities. Let's create a new class. Let's keep this class really simple for now. I'll set up two fields here, one so that we can test out an ability and another so that we can just set a target. We're not going to implement a full targeting system just yet. Let's drag something in. Our ability executor will have one method. We want to execute our selected ability on the target. And when we do that, we want to apply all of the effects associated with that ability to the target. Each of our effects has its own execute method. We just pass in this game object as the source and of course our target. So that we can test this out, let's have an update method here where we just check to see if the spacebar was pressed this frame. If it was, let's run the execute method on our target. Let's go see how this looks in Unity. I've added the ability executor script to my player and I've marked this giant wall as my target. But we need to make some ability data. From the context menu, I'll come down to my new section, scriptable objects, and I'll create a new ability data that I'm just going to call fireball. Now my onEnable method will automatically set the label to be fireball. And if I want to add a new effect now, I can just click the plus icon and get a selection of the different polymorphic types that inherit from ability effect. So maybe we want a damage effect of 10, and maybe we could have a knockback effect of say 20. Actually, maybe that's a lot. That might really blow the wall away. Let's just do something like five. Now back on my player, I'm just going to drag this fireball ability into its ability executor. Now that's all we need for a short test. If I hit control P and go into play mode, here I can hit the space bar and we see the knockback effect immediately on the wall. It starts rocking. And we can also see the output in our debug log. So this is working, but it's a little bit boring. Why don't we jazz it up a bit? We can add to our data-driven approach by defining more data here. Each of our abilities could be associated with an animation we want to play on the character. We might also want to set an amount of time the player needs to cast the spell or ability before any of the effects can actually happen. We might also want to display some VFX when the cast time is up. I'm going to use some effects from this week's Publisher of the Week, and these already have a convenient projectile move script on them. To keep things short today, I'm going to make use of two classes that you might already be familiar with from this channel. 
One is an animation controller, and the other is a countdown timer from our improved timers library. There will be links to these in the video description. In our awake method, let's first of all get a reference to the animation controller, which is a component on the player. Then we can initialize our countdown timer with the cast time that we set in our data. For our cast timer, whenever it starts, we want our animation controller to start playing the animation associated with this ability on our player. When the cast timer stops, we're going to spawn our VFX. Let's spawn the VFX in its own method. First of all, let's have a guard clause. If there's no VFX set, then let's just bail out. Otherwise, let's instantiate our effects, and I've added a new method to the script that came with the store asset called set callback. I don't want any of my effects to be applied unless the projectile actually collides with the target. So let's take the application of our effects, we'll move them out of the execute method, and we'll put them into this set callback method. Now our execute method really only has one responsibility, and that is to start the cast timer. If the cast timer manages to complete, the projectile will get fired, and if it manages to collide with the target, the effects will be applied. The big advantage to this system here is it doesn't matter how many effects you need to apply. You could have 10, you could have 100, you could have 0. It doesn't require additional logical checks inside of your code to handle it. Let's go back into Unity. So we've got a few new fields on our fireball ability data, and I've saved a few things in my favorites already. So I'm going to grab this mage attack animation and drag that in there. And then I'm going to drag this projectile move prefab as well. With this all set up, we just have to go into play mode and check it out. So I'm going to hit control P. Here we go. Let me see if I can find a slightly better angle so we can see what's going on. Once I get a good spot here, I'll press the space bar. When the timer starts, the animation kicks off, and two seconds later, the cast fires. On impact with the wall, the effects take place, and we see the knockback. So the huge pro we're looking at here is that we don't have a tangled mess of if-else statements or switches. Everything is data-driven, everything is configurable inside the editor, and there's almost zero chance that adding an additional ability effect would actually break anything. Now, of course, there are ways to make this even more decoupled and more robust. I think as the summer winds down, we'll start switching gears a little bit to begin talking more in detail about project architecture. Drop a comment below if that sounds good to you. Now, there's just one more thing I want to talk about today, and that's the editor. In almost every video on this channel, you're going to see a version of the editor that has all my favorite assets in them. And one of those assets is Odin Inspector. Here I've opened a vanilla version of the Unity editor that doesn't have Odin Inspector installed. Unity's built-in inspector doesn't support drawing polymorphic serialized reference fields out of the box. So lists like we have here for our effects appear empty unless you write a custom property drawer. Let's create a custom drawer that will render each ability effect entry in our list, including a type selector dropdown. Let's annotate this with the custom property drawer attribute so that we can use this drawer for any field of type ability effect or its subclasses. We'll want to cache a dictionary of all the different types that inherit from ability effect. Then we can override the get property height method. We can return enough space for the dropdown button plus whatever the nested property needs. Let's also add some helpers. We can have a method that will scan all the assemblies for the concrete types that inherit from ability effect. First, let's define the base class we're filtering against. Then we can scan all the assemblies currently loaded into the app domain. We'll flatten each assembly into its own list of types, and we'll skip any that throw reflection errors. We'll use a WHERE clause to filter to only non-abstract subclasses of ability effect. And then we'll use Unity's built-in Niceifier to clean up the type name, and then we'll store it in our dictionary cache. Let's add one more utility method to extract the class name from Unity's mangled manage reference full type name. First of all, let's handle null or empty gracefully. Now, Unity uses the format assembly name space class name. We want to strip the namespace and just return the final segment, for example, damage effect. With these helpers in place, we're now in a good spot to actually write our on GUI method. First of all, let's lazy load our dictionary of types. Then we can reserve some space for the type selector button at the top. The rest of the space will be used to draw the actual property fields after a type is selected. Then we can have our begin property statement. We'll get the current full type name of the serialized object, and we'll pass that into the utility we wrote so that we have a display name. Now let's draw a drop down button. If it's clicked, we want to show a menu of possible types. Let's just go with the generic menu. Now let's double check. If we found no types, let's show some kind of disabled message. We'll show the menu with the disabled entry, and we'll exit early. Nothing to choose from. 
Otherwise, let's loop through all the effect types we found via reflection. We'll get the display name and type object for each entry. We'll add each type to the dropdown. If it's already selected, we'll mark it as checked. If the user selects this type, we'll instantiate it and assign it to the serialized reference. We'll apply the change so Unity picks up the new instance and draws it. Once all these items are added, we'll show the dropdown at the cursor position. I'm just going to hit page down quickly so we have a little bit more room. Almost done. So now, if a valid instance is selected, let's indent for a nicer visual structure. We'll draw the selected instance's fields recursively. Unity will handle this via serialization. Then we'll reset the indentation after drawing the object, and we'll close the property block, and we're all finished. Now back here in vanilla Unity, we now get a prompt to say, choose the effect you want to add. You choose it, and you can use this collapsible box to add any of the properties associated with that particular subclass. For me personally, I find Odin Inspector to be a real time saver, but of course there's nothing that Odin does that you can't do yourself by implementing your own code like this. Now, today's video was prompted because this week I saw an example of an extreme case where there was absolutely no data-driven programming. It was 40,000 lines of conditional statements. One simple change brought the entire system down. We want to be architecting systems in a modular, resilient way, and always keep in mind that the reason we have things like solid principles and programming patterns and the principles of software engineering is to facilitate change. Things always change. You're going to have new requirements. The players are going to want a new feature. Your successful game is going to need a part two, and you don't want to rewrite the entire thing to facilitate that. So we're going to continue exploring these concepts as it applies to programming in Unity and software architecture in general. But if there's one takeaway you can have from this video, it's the next time you write a sequence of if-else statements, consider whether or not that behavior would be better represented by data. So hit the like button if you're interested in seeing more videos about project architecture and system design. Of course, subscribe to the channel and make sure notifications are turned on. Don't forget we have a Discord channel. It's very active, lots going on. You'll meet more people just like yourself who love talking about subjects just like this one. I'll throw another video up on the screen. Maybe I'll see you there.